Hey, how's it going? It's Keith Townsend from the CTOadvisor.com. We're going to talk cloud lift and shift strategies, specifically three issues that concern most enterprises when dealing with cloud lift and shift and how Oracle Cloud infrastructure and VMware Cloud on AWS addresses those three issues. So your organization has made the decision to lift and shift to the cloud. This is no longer an argument on whether or not it's financially viable to lift and shift to the cloud versus staying in a private data center. That discussion has been had, the decision has been made. Now you must go forth and implement it and achieve it within budget and be operationally successful. That's the focus of the conversation. With that comes three, I think, primary issues. The first being cost. Many cloud migrations fail at cost before the migration is even complete. Data center workloads were designed to operate within a private data center. So from a cost perspective, you have these fixed costs of your virtualized infrastructure. You can utilize that 20%, 80%, and it really doesn't change your operating and capital expenditure budget tremendously. In the cloud, when you deploy static workloads in an environment that, were, that was built off of billing for elasticity as opposed to static workloads, there's going to be an impedance mismatch and you're going to pay the cost penalty for using the cloud to support static workloads. So first off, we need to mitigate that first risk of cost. How does Oracle Cloud versus VMware Cloud on AWS approach that problem? Well, we did an earlier video for the VMware Cloud on AWS compared to EC2. Basically, we have this model where we have fixed access. We can oversubscribe them, undersubscribe them, and you can kind of get a per VM cost that's cheaper than EC2. Both Oracle and VMware allow for this model. However, Oracle slightly adjusts for this. While VMware gives you an entire physical node or total of four physical nodes in which you can deploy your VMware workloads into and manage those, the, the oversubscription of that as you wish, Oracle gives you bare metal servers. These bare metal servers, you can install hypervisors, you can install uh, bare metal workloads, so a container host, or all the way up to a VMware ESXi host. I don't think there's a, a model of support between the two companies, but in theory, technically, there's nothing stopping you from installing either. VMware uh, ESXi works perfectly fine on their servers that I can tell. Then, of course, uh, Oracle supports Hyper-V fully. And then Oracle allows you to go a step further and, and deploy actual physical workloads on there. This is where your Oracle Racks, your Exadatas come into play and you can deploy those systems on what Oracle promises a cost-effective manner. So that deals with cost. Now the second challenge is the technical challenge. Will the workload run within the private cloud? The private cloud workload rather run in the public cloud. A VM is a VM, whether that VM is running on KVM, Oracle's VirtualBox or Hypervisor or KVM or Hyper-V, VMware ESXi. Virtual machines are more or less portable these days. So if your workload is running in a virtual machine in your private data center, chances are they'll, it'll run in the public data center. The one concern that many organizations have is mainly around performance. Again, you run into noisy neighbor problems in EC2, Google Compute. You don't control the underlying infrastructure, so you can't control where workloads run. Well, obviously, VMware Cloud on AWS allows for you to utilize DRS or even static controls for you to put exactly what workloads you want to run next to what workloads, and that mitigates the challenge 
of performance, at least from a virtual server instance. And then this is still vSphere. So if you wanted to dedicate an entire physical host to a single workload, you can do that. It just runs, you have the hypervisor and one really big VM that consumes that entire server. Oracle's approach, you can do very much the same thing, or you can put a physical, dedicate a workload to a single physical host and take out the virtualization layer. So if you want to run an Oracle database on bare metal hardware, Oracle allows you to do that in their platform. So the last piece is operations. I think this is one of those areas that organizations forego. I asked Oracle's team at the Revelo Blogger Day about this, and I'll follow this up at the Cloud Field Day that's happening in April. Operations is one of these things that really overlooked. If you've ever logged into EC2 and looked at the console or logged into AWS and looked at the console, there's literally hundreds of services to, to choose from. So there's a training and operations migration that you have to go through. And your staff has to learn how to one, monitor applications, troubleshoot applications, and then learn the cloud control plane of your selected cloud provider. That is a operational risk that organizations shouldn't take lightly. So how does VMware Cloud on AWS mitigate that risk? One, it's vSphere. If you have a vSphere operations team now, you'll get the same experience with the exception of VMware provides the maintenance of vSphere. So they do the installation of vSphere, vCenter, the physical host provisioning, et cetera. And your team only consumes vSphere as a SaaS service. Changes the operations a little bit as the mindset has to shift from consuming infrastructure as a provider and now consuming infrastructure as only a consumer. Mind shift a little bit, but the learning curve is nowhere near as steep as going to Google Compute, EC2, or Azure natively. How does Oracle do this? Well, you're getting bare metal servers. One big question we had at Oracle is, you know what? Do we have to use Oracle tools? No, Oracle is specifically going after lift and shift type of workloads where you can take your existing operations and applications and place those on bare metal, which allows for the mitigation of the risk from oper from having an impedance mismatch, similar to the impedance mismatch we got, with cost with operations. If you have other options, I'd love to hear about them. You can share them with me in the comment section below. If you're listening to this as a podcast, that's right, the CTO Dose is now available as a podcast. You can reach me at CTO Advisor on Twitter or go to the website, thectoadvisor.com. Talk to you next, CTO Dose.